And, you know, but I, you and I have met people like that. That's not the reason to leave. I believe we have one more question that we can take now. The question is, what should you do if you don't agree with the way the services are conducted, especially the music? Bring earplugs. <laughs> well, I, I certainly don't want to give people the idea that music does not matter. You just heard Kelly's testimony. It's a very controversial subject. It does matter. And worship is very important. Understanding biblical worship is very important. In the last days, the final issue is going to revolve around those who worship God and those who worship the beast. Isn't that right? Mm -hmm. So we need to understand how we should worship God. But that doesn't mean as soon as the song leader in your church picks a song or a tempo, then you think that this is just over the top, that you storm out and don't come back. I think the way to deal with that is, first of all, have good communication in your church family. Talk to the pastor. Talk to the music minister first. And the pastor, you may need to write a nice letter, Christian, do it in a Christian way to the board and say, here are the scriptures can we try to f use these as guidelines? Or if I'm wrong, please show me. And I think communicating with truth is one of the best ways for music not to tear churches apart, but to bring them together in studying how do we worship God. I think more churches need to get together and study it, and you'll find a lot more harmony. So you're emphasizing the spirit in which we approach the issue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that can turn it off right there. If we approach with a judgmental spirit, uh, people don't want to hear us, but if they know that you're involved in the church, you're committed to the church, you're a loving, caring member, right. and you bring a concern, they'll be more apt to listen to your concern and, and try and resolve the situation. That's right. Well, thank you for all of the questions that were sent in. And those of you who are watching, you can send us any question that you might have with reference to coming back to church or getting connected with Christ. We're going to give you a text number. The text number will be on your screen. Uh, you can send us your question via text. Send your text question. The number is 760-523-2287. Again, that number is 760-523-2287. You can also go to the website, faithreclaim.com, and you can also send us an email with your question. Pastor Doug, that's it for our question time this evening. I think we're going to have another testimony. We've been encouraging testimonies. So you see people who have come back to the Lord, and at this time we have another to share with you. My mother passed away when I was three, and my paternal grandparents decided they would care for my two older sisters and I so that my father would have time to mourn. We never really had a, a mother or a strong fatherly figure, and I'm not blaming my dad. I'm just saying that's how things worked out. When I was in high school, my oldest sister got into an argument with our father. And my sister and I decided that we would take her side. And so that caused a split in our family. For four years, we lived in the same house. We ate from the same pot. We used the same restroom. We walked by each other, but we never said anything to our father, and he never said anything to us. A year later, I had decided I would move out for college. He wasn't very happy with that. We got booted out of the house. We went back to apologize, but we weren't really accepted back. I have felt so alone a lot of my life. I felt like I've had to fend more for myself. I've been missing a fatherly love. I don't have family with me. I don't have a lot of things. But um, I have God, and I've been fulfilled. I've been satisfied. God has been my father. My name is Luisa Manu, and I've reclaimed my faith. You know, many of these testimonies that you're hearing are people who actually went to the um, AFCO program. They're people from all around the country and the world who came to Amazing Facts and they trained in how to share their faith with others. And we were surprised what a large percentage of people that were all of a sudden filled with a burning desire to share their faith with others 
they had drifted away. When they came back, they realized the key to life is receiving Christ and sharing Christ. And their whole perspective changed. Well, we'd like to welcome you once again to reclaim your faith, friends. And I want to thank you for those who have come here in the Maryland area and those who may be watching all over the world and all over North America. And we're very thankful that you've tuned in. We're talking about some of the different reasons that people become discouraged and stop going to church and what the solution to those things is. So what's the right view that we should have regarding some of the issues that, that discourage people and get them to jump ship, so to speak? One of the principal things when we interview people is dealing with what we call friendly fire. Somebody in the church did something to hurt them, or some group or some clique in the church hurt them. Sometimes they're even upset with God. So they've pulled back because they've been hurt. You know, I understand that during the Gulf War in 1991, that first invasion, by the way, our son Daniel was there then in Iraq, that of the 131, I'm sorry, no, 148 uh, young men and women that were killed during that time in that war, 31% were as a result of friendly fire. There's no other war like that where you, they were accidental deaths. Now you might be thinking, well, but Pastor Doug, at least they were accidents. What these people did to me in church, that was on purpose. I might also mention at this time, of all the calls that police get, you know what the largest category is of police calls? Domestic problems. Family fights. You know, I've just learned that um, when people get together, you're sometimes going to have problems. And you see that was true also in the Bible. Do not get discouraged. Do not leave church because someone in the church hurt you. This is exactly what the devil wants to do. Think in the Bible of all the characters that struggled with friendly fire. The first murder in the Bible is Cain killing his brother, Abel. You've got the story of Joseph in the Bible. What happened to him? His brothers just couldn't get along with him. Did he do anything wrong? It wasn't his fault. By the way, with Abel, Cain was upset with not his badness, but his goodness. With Joseph, his brothers were not upset at his badness. They were upset at his dreams and his goodness. King David. He had his problems. He had a lot more problems with his own son and his own king than he had from Goliath. Goliath he took care of pretty quickly. For years he ran from King Saul and his own son tried to kill him. Problems in the house. Friendly fire. And David left for a while. Fled to the land of the Philistines. And then God said, what are you doing here? You know, I think what will help us some of you who are watching, you say, oh, Pastor Doug, you don't know what they did to me. I know generally that might be true, but what they did to me, I think you've got to realize this is exactly what the devil wants us to do. He wants us to be hurt by this uh, friendly fire, by the horizontal problems that we have, so we turn away from him or we blame God. Picture, if you will, for a moment. Some people pay to go on a safari through a jungle, South America or Africa, and they're looking at the rainforest. They're going single file through the jungle, and they're looking to the right, and they're looking to the left, and there are monkeys in the trees, and these are bad monkeys. And the monkeys are throwing nuts and branches and fruit at one of the men, but he doesn't know where it comes from, and he turns around. He thinks it's in the, the person in line behind him. He says, why'd you do that? I didn't do anything. I know you did. You just bonked me on the head with a piece of fruit. I didn't do anything. And so they turn around. They're walking down the trail. They're all both looking off at the flowers again. And bing. Why was, what did I do? And pretty soon they're all fighting among themselves and the monkeys are laughing in the trees. <laughs> are there devils and demons out there? Do they do everything they can to accent and accentuate our disagreements, manufacturing things that really aren't real? Sometimes because our slighted pride and they get magnified and the devil is working all the time to create division and cause friendly fire. This is his plan. He is trying to cause problems. I, like I said a minute ago, you might be thinking, well, Pastor Doug, yeah, but 
this person, it wasn't imagined, they really did something very mean to me. All right, another scenario. Nice family invites you over to their house for dinner someday after church. And you've never been there before. They seem like sweet people. And you sit around as dinner's being prepared. You visit. You're having a wonderful time. And they say, well, we're going to go sit down at the dining table. And we're going to eat. You say, right, somewhere I can wash my hands. You sure? They're down the hall to the right. And so you meander through their house. You find the restroom. You wash your hands. And as you come out of the restroom, there is this grumpy old man there. And he said, what are you doing here? You're not, this is my bathroom. Don't you use my bathroom. He said, and by the way, you're ugly. And I don't like strangers in my house, and I have nothing left to eat when all these strange people come over eating my food. And I hope I never see you. And then they begin to hurl insults and curse at you, just as mean as you can imagine. And boy, your heart starts to race, and you get all upset. And pretty soon you go to the hall, and you're going to get your coat. And your host says, what's happening? So I'm leaving. What's happening? Oh, this man, I've never been spoken to like that before in my life. And they said, you didn't run into Grandpa, did you? I don't know who he is. You ran into Grandpa. Please, don't get upset. Grandpa's not well. <laughs> Grandpa has dementia. He used to be the nicest guy in the world, but just part of his brain isn't healthy, and he just now, we don't know what's going on. But, and as soon as you realize that Grandpa's sick, you say, oh, yeah, I guess I understand now. They can't help it. They're not well. There are people in the church who are sick, and they do mean things. If they are not filled with God's spirit, they've got a diabolical dementia. And they're doing exactly what you would expect them to do. And so don't take it out on Jesus. Don't take it out on the other members of the church and your relationship with the church to say, all right, brother, sister, sorry you feel that way. And then you can walk up and you can say to yourself, Spiritual dementia. <laughs> they're, they're, they're just not well. They don't have that love in their heart. We all do selfish things. Even in Jesus' day. One moment, Jesus says to the apostles, who do you say that I am? Peter jumps up. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus gives Peter the greatest compliment he ever had. He says, Simon Peter, flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you, but the Holy Spirit, God, spoke to you. Before 20 minutes go by, Jesus says, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be betrayed there. I'll be crucified. I'll rise the third day. Peter comes over. He says, Lord, don't talk like that. This is not God's plan for you. That same Jesus turns to Peter, and he says, get behind me, Satan. you got dementia. <laughs> Jesus looked behind his friend Peter to who was operating through Peter, and he didn't blame Peter. He blamed the devil. People in the church hurt each other because the devil often speaks, sometimes through those closest to us. You'll always have your best fights on your way to church <laughs> with your loved ones. Isn't that right? Because the devil is working overtime, like the monkey in the trees, to try to create division among us on the ground. We're all sinners. It's interesting. The Bible tells us that we're to love our neighbor, Neighbor is a nigh brother. Nigh brothers are not any closer than those in your family and those in your church. It says, love your neighbor. Then Jesus says, and love your enemy. I think it's interesting that he says we should love our neighbor and love our enemy. Is it because, is it possible that our neighbor often becomes our enemy? It's sometimes our nigh brother or sister can, can become our greatest adversary. Jesus comes home from praising the Lord in the street. There's a parade with God and his ark, and everybody's singing. He's on cloud nine. He walks through the door, and his wife said, Boy, you made such a spectacle out of yourself today. <laughs> Bring him right back down again. Sometimes it's those right in the family. Don't be discouraged by that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 through 7. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another. Be submissive to one another. And be clothed with humility. I've done more marriage counseling than I'm qualified to do or than I want to do. Um, but one thing I've found in most cases, 
there is an element of selfishness and pride involved.